Hello again and welcome back to the channel. Today I have another video of Jordan Peterson alongside Bishop Barron and they are going to be talking about Jesus, the atonement, and also the idea of why would Jesus need to come to earth or how to properly view Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. So let's watch this video and then I will have a few brief comments afterwards. It's a crucial concern. You said something so surprising that Christ on the cross was offering up the proper praise to God. It's like, well, I'm not going to just let you say that without <laughs> noticing it, because that's a hell of a thing to say. So I'm going to put together some things that you touched on, and, and then we can address this. So you said in the Bible, one of the things that's remarkable about it is the conception of the divine. So the conception of what is of highest worth yeah. is stripped from some of its obvious objects of projection, the sun, the moon, the cosmos, the stars, yeah. um, but then also earthly leaders of other cultures, idols, and also earthly leaders of your own culture says, no, whatever the ultimate divine is, it's not to be found in its fullest expression in any of those examples. It's something else. Okay, so then the question is, well, what is that else? Well, the Christian answer is, well, whatever it is, for in its human form, let's say, it's something human. It's something that humans can aspire to. It's both of those. And, and, and it's made manifest in the figure of Christ something specifically human, but then you have this terrible paradox with Christ, which is partly the paradox that you just laid out, which is a very difficult thing to get a grip on. So what is it exactly? Why is what Christ is doing proper sacrifice? Is it because it is, what is it? His willingness to bear the pain? What is it? Yeah, I, that's close to it. So we say the word became flesh. So the, the word who is always in the presence of the Father. So the word doesn't worship the Father because the word is God. So that, we shouldn't talk about worship within the Trinity itself, but now the word becomes flesh. Because the Father, God so loved the world, he sent his only Son, that all who believe in him might have eternal life in his name. He sends the Son into flesh, but into flesh that's been so compromised by sin, so not into a pristine creation. Now, now would he have? That's an interesting question theologically. Would he have sent the Son if creation had not fallen? That's an interesting question. But right. In the, fact, the, it did. The, the valuable fall that laid the, yeah, the groundwork Fils Kulpa, right. for, yes, it's a right, remarkable but, idea. It is indeed, but like Duns Scotus argued, you know, the Franciscan medieval theologian, that God would have sent his son even if we hadn't sent. But that's another question. Okay, so let's take that apart for just a sec so that people are clear about it. So the theory here is that there is something wrong with the structure of creation. That, that's its steepness and sin. And everyone has to ask if they believe that. And, and it seems to me that people do, is there's a sense that things aren't how they should be, that we're not yeah. how we could be, that something right. it has gone astray and is continuing to go astray, which is a mystery in and of itself if it's a God-created world. It's like, well, yeah. why is that well, precisely? Well, I mean, the quick answer is is corrupted freedom, you know, or, or a, a misguided freedom, you might say. But the word comes into flesh, into fallen flesh. And the cross is what? The cross is cruelty and hatred and violence and institutional injustice and stupidity. And you know, if you read the, the passion narratives, it's a, it's a beautiful sort of poetic presentation of all that's wrong with us that comes out to meet him. And bearing all of that, he continues in his relationship of of obedience and unity with the Father. So bearing the sins of the world, bearing all the dysfunction and, and twisted quality of the world, he brings us back online. So in, in the attitude of the word made flesh on the cross, we see a sinful, corrupt, hate-filled world now brought painfully back online. That's the sacrifice of the cross that's pleasing to the Father. So we should never play the game of, well, the Father is like a, is a, dysfunctional alcoholic father that, you know, is now demanding this blood sacrifice. It's, it's rather the father is pleased by the son's entry into our fallen situation and his bearing of all that dysfunction, even as he brings us back online to the father. Okay, so why does, okay, so let's say Christ maintains his, I know this isn't exactly the right way of thinking about it, but it'll work for rhetorical purposes, I think. It's, so Christ is tortured by betrayal, by, by, by physically yeah. and spiritually as well, because the best way to torment someone is when is to punish them despite their innocence, right? Yeah, so, right, right, right. right. Or maybe worse than that, to punish them because of their virtues. That's even mm -hmm. better. And so that's, that's intrinsic in the story as well. Christ bears up under that. He doesn't repudiate God or doesn't repudiate his own essence. It's something like that. He, but the, then what, is the, is the example of that, is the example of bearing up under that exceptional duress and maintaining a moral stance, is that the example that redeems the world? Is it that if you do that in your own life, the world is de facto redeemed? It, it is that, but more, because if it's just that, then a Pelagian system would be true, that we just need a good you know, moral exemplar. It, it's something more, well, it's a bit more, more than just merely good. I mean, it's superhuman right, it's, what's being asked for. 
No, true, but it, it's something more metaphysical about it. It's a reworking of the way things are. If, if Jesus takes upon himself all the dysfunction of the world and swallows it up in the ever greater divine mercy, so it's, it's Christ bearing all of our dysfunction, but transfiguring it in his great act of, of forgiveness and obedience to the Father. I think all of that coming together simultaneously is the sacrifice that's pleasing to the Father. In some ways, the word from the cross, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do, is the, is the most important. Or, or play with this too, Jordan, that after the resurrection, so Jesus comes back precisely to those who had denied him and betrayed him and, and run from him in his moment of greatest need. And in, in almost any telling of a similar story, if that had all happened, and then the person who had died is back from the dead, and he appears to those who had abandoned him, you'd expect him to you know, wreak havoc on them, right? So Jesus shows his wounds to be sure, because the wounds of Jesus are a sign of the world's dysfunction. If I'm ever tempted, you know, when we were younger, the book, um, I'm okay, you're okay, came out, right? And so we're always tempted to say, well, you know, basically we're okay. You just need a little fixing up around the edges. Whenever we're tempted to say that, it's the wounds of Jesus that say otherwise. Because yeah, that's author... why I was insisting earlier that I don't, you know, that that it isn't merely misguided good that turns people towards the, the darkness. It's, it's, it's voluntary desire to produce the darkness as well. Anyways, I do take yeah. that very seriously. And it's an interesting idea is that the ideal is wounded in proportion to the degree that everything has deteriorated away from the ideal. And that's almost by definition true. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's true. But it's just the it's the very act of the will itself is structured in such a way it has to be seeking some kind of at least apparent good. But that's our earlier issue. Um, so the wounds show the, the dysfunction of the world, which the Son of God took upon himself. But then, then the word of shalom, which is in all the resurrection accounts that Jesus says, peace. So when, when Paul, for example, says, I'm certain that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor height nor depth, nor any other creature could ever separate us from the love of God. How does he know that? Because we killed God, and he returned with a word of forgiveness. So, so that means it's like, it's, it's, it's like for the divine goodness and forgiveness can trump any evil, even the evil of killing God. <laughs> so we, we killed him, but yet he returned in forgiving love. I think that's the moment when Christianity is born, in, in the dual sense of, yes, we killed him, look at the wounds, but he says shalom to us nevertheless, so that I, I can't run away from him. I can try, you know, that's what all the sinners do. I can try, but ultimately the divine love is such that it's, it's greater. All right, so that conversation was really, really fascinating to me. They're talking about lots of things that I think that the early church was talking about in terms of how to understand Christ, under, understanding why he had to come to the earth, um, you know, the, the natures, the incarnation. And I think that Jordan Peterson poses some really interesting apologetic questions that, that might need to be answered and resolved. Uh, in other videos, for example, he basically, in effect, asks the question, why in the world would Jesus have to die? Or as he put it in the beginning of the video, why is Jesus Christ dying on the cross uh, the proper praise? Now, that he seems to be responding to something that wasn't in this clip, but it is a thought-provoking question. He also asks the question about, he, he, he talks a little bit about the issue of sin, for example, and he says basically that, it seems that the majority of people believe that, but it, it, it also begs the question, if why would God, if he's perfect, create a world in which that was even possible? And of course, Bishop Barron responds by saying some sort of free will is in play to make sense of that perceived conundrum. And it's a really interesting back and forth dialogue. Now, what's interesting ultimately to perceive is each one of them has an answer to this question. And we could basically put the, the answer in this way. What, how do we deal and resolve the paradox of Jesus Christ? Peterson says that the answer, and he's really doing it through kind of investigating Bishop Barron's responses to these questions. Peterson's basically saying that the answer is to be like Jesus. He's kind of this moral example, and, and, and Bishop Barron actually kind of highlights that. Can't be that, but Peterson wants to basically say that the, the redemption in the narrative or in the story is that is the moral example that Jesus Christ put forth. And if we live into that story, if we live into that reality and we, and we be, become and are like Jesus, we'll be redeemed too. So it's a self-salvation um, narrative. It's really a neo-moral influence theory of the atonement. Now, there's a really good book that I had to read on this, and I will provide a um, link 
uh, in the description below to this book. It highlights different theories of atonements. And this is a caveat. Jordan Peterson, you might be thinking, wow, these are really, really original things that Jordan Peterson is saying. They're really not. He's basically just, he's basically just explaining in a modern way the Catholic theological position of the moral influence theory. Now, this moral influence theory is basically that Jesus Christ is our moral, it sometimes it's called the moral example theory. Jesus Christ is our moral example and we are saved. Basically, it's everything that Jordan Peterson is saying. Now, Bishop Barron highlights and says that's a Pelagian way of viewing things, and of course he's right, and he offers the satisfaction theory of atonement, which is basically this idea that in Jesus Christ, everything's coming together, the moral order or created order of the universe find its culmination in this sacrifice that Jesus Christ provides. Now, Calvin and Protestant traditions will come along and they will modify that satisfaction theory and you, you'll even see the, the issue here and why I'm bringing all this up is it's really like having an old discussion around, like it's almost as if we were in the Council uh, of Chalcedon thinking through these things. But this satisfaction theory of atonement as put forth by Bishop Barron um, is basically seen by Anselm as metaphysically necessary. That's why he says it's a metaphysical issue. It's metaphysically necessary that Jesus do this. And that's why he also mentions this idea that um, some theologians talk about the idea of Jesus would have come down to earth uh, even if there wasn't any sin. That's all connected to this Catholic tradition of understanding that it was metaphysically necessary that Jesus Christ came to the earth. Calvin comes along and other Protestants come along and say it's not metaphysically necessary that Jesus Christ come to earth uh, to satisfy um, to, to justify to be a substitute. Satisfaction theory as proposed by Bishop Aaron does have substitution in it, but it's rather in the divine decree of God. So Calvin put it in predestination. He put it in the divine decree to God, divine decree of God and not in the metaphysical necessity of logic. And so Calvin went to the Bible to basically put together this system of understanding substitution and he came up with a modified satisf uh, satisfaction theory, which stems from the divine decree. And it's, it's basically purely by God's grace. There's no synchronization of free will. Um, that's another part that would be a part of it. Um, but he basically shows that not only did it's just purely of grace that God saves us through Jesus Christ, and it's purely because of him and in him that that took place. It's his divine decree. Now, this is a really interesting discussion. I would encourage you to read this book and to look in the different theories. Um, again, Peterson is basically saying you got to be like Jesus to be saved, and Barron is saying look to Jesus to be saved. Uh, to, sa to be saved. And I would would add there was one thing that Bishop Barron said that wasn't very helpful. He was basically basic. He was basically saying that at the moment, the 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 crux of the matter, the cross, um, it was Jesus basically taking all of, it's the satisfaction theory as put forth by Anselm. He's basically reordering the world and its dysfunction. And so it's a very, very generalized view of salvation. And what I would want to say to that is it's not just the world's dysfunction that Christ, you know, solved by sacrificing himself on the cross. It's not just the world's dysfunction, but my damnation. You see, the cross is an altar. <laughs> Jesus Christ went to the altar, sacrificed himself in my place. And that's the key with all of this. It's a substitution so that what we see when we look at Christ is we see our sins. And when God looks at Christ, he doesn't just see a new reordered universe. He sees me. And that's the fundamental distinction that I think both of them need to see is that for Peterson, he needs to look to Jesus and to what Jesus has done for his own salvation. And what I would say to Barron, Bishop Barron, is it's not just looking to Jesus and what he's done for the world. It's what he's done for me. You see, it's not just um, who Christ is and being like Christ, but Christ in and through me. The paradox is this, that that God, the Holy Spirit, because of what Jesus Christ has done, has not just reordered the world or I'm not just summoned to be a moral example like him, but that Christ, Jesus Christ himself, through the indwelling Holy Spirit, lives within 
me. That's a paradox that is a divine mystery that I don't think will ever be solved. But it's something so precious and so dear that actually allows us to live and make it through this life, which I think talks to both of what they're saying. And ultimately, it's Jesus and Jesus Christ within us that saves us. Think about that. Grace and peace, and I will see you the next time.